Hey everyone, welcome again to another episode of Coffee and Commerce. I have my coffee, um, wrapping reanimator coffee from Philadelphia. Yeah, there we go. The personality mugs, always a great touch. Um, so today, very special episode. You're going to learn a lot and I'm going to learn a lot, which I always love, of course. Um, we have Deb Mecca with us today. Um, so yeah, Deb. Tell us a little bit about yourself and hey. then I'll, you know, introduce the topic. Sure. Hey, everybody. Thanks for joining us today. Super excited to be here and have a nice conversation with EM about all things e-commerce and some fun subjects that we're going to get into today. Um, I've been in e-commerce for since 2013, 2014 time period. And I work with Shopify apps now, uh, but I really love emerging technology. I love things that help move the needle on merchants' businesses in creative ways. And so today I'm really excited to talk about some of those areas. Um, I work for a company called LTD SaaS Growth Fund, and I do marketing. I'm the director of marketing for 10 Shopify apps. And all the apps help with increasing your average order value and conversions. So. Those are two topics that we love here. You know, if this is not your first episode. Um, so yeah, I think I'm just going to jump right into it. And we were, we were talking and I guess the pre-roll about, you know, being, you know, someone who appreciates new technology versus being someone who's kind of a Luddite, which is me. So I would love to hear a little bit about, you know, what's happening in the industry, like what's new, what's trending. Yeah. I mean, there's a lot that's happening. I think social commerce is definitely on the rise. I think last year, the last couple of years with everything that's happened with Facebook marketing or meta marketing, I don't know, right? <laughs> is that the new rebrand? Re um, I just feel like so, meta, yeah, it, it sounds right. like it's, I guess it's making fun of itself. Maybe it's like self-referential. Who knows? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I want to be... Uh, you know, cognizant of the rebrand. So I, I try to say it, but like, there's always a little <laughs> inside that when yeah. I, say it. um, but yeah, it'll I, always be friendster to me. It'll always be friendster. <laughs> it'll all, always be my space 2.0 to me. <laughs> <laughs> my space without Tom. Yeah. Where is Tom? Well, okay. Let's not get off subject. <laughs> I was friends with Tom. We were close. Um, Anyway, so I think with um, with everything that kind of got shaken up with Facebook ads over the past couple of years, merchant, and then of course with the pandemic where people couldn't go face to face, I think people are really looking towards the experience economy in a much bigger way and looking for opportunities to make a big splash to on the, the store side to their customers. And then customers really want to be wowed more than ever before. So how can you do that in a way that is cost effective? That's, go you know, I think if a customer comes into your store, they're either going to buy or they're going to abandon. And if they abandon and you don't have a really strong strategy to get them to come back, they're never coming back. And so what are you going to do to, first of all, create those traffic sources to get people to come in. They're already wowed before they get there. And then on the back end, once they get there, what are you going to do to, to make that experience really exciting? So um, there's a couple of things that I think are worth touching on today that, um, you know, merchants should be considering if they're not considering it this year. Um, you know, I don't want to scare anyone, but I definitely think that there's <laughs> a huge opportunity out there that's untapped. And, you know, I'm old enough to remember Google ads like PPC and it's like the early bird definitely got the worm in terms of like relevancy, better cost per click, all of that stuff. And so I think when you're thinking about social commerce in general, um, you know, it's, it's really tough to try out new things. It's really tough to test out new channels that haven't been proven or maybe you do throw a little bit of money towards it and didn't work a year ago. And so you're like, well, that didn't work for me. So I'm definitely not going to try it again. And it's like, you see all this data to say like, Hey, TikTok's really, TikTok's really blowing up for merchants right now. And they're, you know, how do I then get in there and start doing some stuff with it? So I think from a 
driving traffic standpoint, I've got my eye on a few different things. So let's talk about those few different things. And then we'll go into the post click side. So once, once they get into the store, some cool emergence, emerging technologies that we need to consider. So on the pre-click side, you know, we talked about TikTok a little bit. And I think that that's something that if you're not taking advantage of today as a brand, you should definitely be considering it because it's not going away. It's only going to continue to grow and continue to become something of value to especially Shopify merchants. So um, there's a, a direct integration with Shopify catalogs that enable you to, to, to sell products. Like if you wanted to do like a, a live shopping experience on TikTok, uh, they've made it easy for you to do so. And you can test it out. I mean, it's not really that difficult. It's not time consuming. Um, yeah, you do need to have a strategy. You do need to kind of go in there with a plan and know what you're going to do. Um, but I think you can kind of test the waters in very small ways at first and then see how it goes and kind of build up from there. Um, you know, people want to be sold by people. It's it gone with the days of really high produced uh, creative. So you can just throw on some makeup, have a clean background, have your products ready to go and be ready to start talking about them, demonstrating them and explaining how they're valuable and then kind of test around with that and see how that goes. So I think TikTok is an area definitely worth looking into, not only just from like organic content creation, but also like the live shopping opportunity that they offer. Um, another, you know, obviously Instagram has a similar type of thing with Shopify. So that's also an area of opportunity to, to spend some time on. And if you're not already uh, benefiting from, I mean, obviously the catalog, the syncing of the catalog with your Shopify store is already available. So you can just throw up some like content in there um, and have it linked directly to products and they can transact directly on the app, which is really cool. Uh, but you could also do some like live shopping on there, which is really fun and worth testing out. Um, and then I think something that isn't really talked about enough or like tested out enough, which I don't understand is Snapchat. So Snapchat um, has these really cool features that are an augmented reality. Um, so if you're like a beauty brand or you're selling, you know, glasses or hats or purses, you know, Gucci just recently, uh, Gucci did a push with AR where, or Prada, where you can like try in a bunch of different bags without ever going into oh, a store. I love that. Right. See, I, I'm still of the school of thought that if you have a Snapchat, you have it for like one reason. Oh, but right. I guess they're trying to rebrand and that reason is now see what you look like with some, some Prada boots, some Prada boots, um, <laughs> <laughs> some, some watches, some really high end. So like high ticket items are really good on there because you know, the risk of returns is really high as a merchant. And then as a buyer, the risk of you having to go through that return process is high. And so if you can try on like a really high end watch, um, or some really fun glasses, you know, I didn't know if these were going to look good on me. So I actually bought them online. And then I went into the store during the pandemic, and I had to make an appointment. And that was really crappy experience. Like it wasn't a fun experience, especially during the pandemic. So if yeah. I had the ability to go on Snapchat and try these on, then my buyer confidence would have been a lot higher. Yeah, no, that's such a good point. I think all the time about, you know, just with COVID lowering the barrier to entry, we've talked about this on this show before, it's, but it's it's so true is, you know, things that we never would have bought online or things that, you know, we might have been more hesitant to buy online, you know, we're buying online now. Like that, I don't know if everyone heard that, but my dog was just freaking out and I had to mute myself because the, the FedEx person came with my wine delivery and it's like, you know, well, it's 10 <laughs> years ago, would you have thought like, yeah, I'd just be getting wine delivered to my house, like, it's such a vibe. I look forward to that day every month when my wine shows up. <laughs> the biggest deal in the world. Um, and it's not a surprise. Like I know exactly what's showing up, but it's like touching it, feeling it, looking through. They send me like these, you know, descriptions of what everything is. And I'm like, ah, oh, it's just amazing. Yeah, it's okay, I got... an interesting. Oh, what was that? Oh, good. Oh, um, I was going to say it's interesting because, you know, you were talking about Snapchat bringing, you know, the 
almost like an offline experience online where you can try things on. I feel like with a lot of merchants that or what a lot of merchants are doing now, especially in the case of wine, is they're bringing this offline experience and adding a whole new level to it by bringing it back online, you know, with tasting notes and like videos that you can watch about the wine and learn the history of it. And it's just, you know, very, um, it's like truly omni-channel, but not even from a like conversion point of view. It's the whole experience is just online, offline. It's, it's very fascinating what's happening. It's so fascinating. And like with live shopping as well, I don't know if you've ever spent any time on like a platform like network or any of the other platforms that do, or even just TikTok looking through that, but what can be done, you know, it's, it's merging influencer marketing and UGC in one, and it's really inspiring people to feel a lot more confident about the purchase. You can also ask questions. So from a customer service standpoint, you can get your questions answered in real time. You're not going through like a help desk type scenario where you're having to wait. Um, and you're talking to like a real person that's got the product, that's trying it on, that's kind of showing you a little bit about it. Like, um, you know, I, I, yesterday I was looking, I was deep diving on um, the Dyson hair dryer, dryer compared to like the Revlon hair dryer. I and have like, the air wrap. It is worth every penny. Is it? Okay. Yeah, yeah, I'm like, totally worth it. Should I spend the 45 or should I spend the 500? I don't know. Not sure yet. Um, but if, if it was live and I can ask questions in real time and like really kind of get a better sense of what's going on from that person and seeing it, like seeing how smooth it makes, you know, the one side versus the other side and like really kind of getting a little bit more into it with that, I think a lot of sales could happen. Also, I think, you know, you could do things with like deeper discounts. So like group buying availability. So if you wanted to, um, you know, like know that your audience is like hundred people that are watching, you can offer something, you know, d during that period of time that says like, it's almost like a bulk discount wholesale sort of situation, but it's happening in real time is really cool. Um, and then it creates like a scarcity element. So like you're scared that it's going to like, I know all these like influence, like YouTubers and stuff, when they do a merch drop, they do this like scarcity thing where it's like, yeah, it's launching, it's launching, you're going to miss out. And so I feel like the live shopping creates that like psychological scarcity feeling to where if you don't get it now, then it may not be an inventory later, which is really yeah. kind of you're a gonna have to buy it from a reseller with like a 10 times uh you know yeah. increase in the price <laughs> yeah it's on stock x yeah um i want to so we're talking a lot about strategies really good strategies um i want to talk a little bit about you know new tech and you know implementing new tech and how it can be kind of daunting how a lot of merchants you know sometimes will implement a new strategy have new tech but not actually do anything with it and um so i guess you know, based on what you've seen, how can merchants really decide on which of these strategies and techs are best for them and then set goals for, you know, tracking the success and getting to where they want to be with it? Yeah, I mean, I think that there's some immediacy that goes on with especially things like live shopping or the social commerce stuff that we talked about. And I haven't even gotten into like the VR stuff, which I think is worth touching on a little bit as well, which is on more like the post-click side. We're not even talking about like virtual shopping malls or metaverse yet. Um, more like 3D models that could happen on your store and Shopify enables you to do that. They have some really good tools already in place today that you could do that. So you basically just need um, images of your uh, products and then it you, you can create variants like different color swatches, different textures, um, you know, obviously you're going to need somebody with a technical wherewithal to be able to help you implement this. But I think back to what we were saying before, where customers are expecting a lot more out of the buying experience and they will abandon your store and never come back again. And so if you're offering them like a 3d view of your products or even like an AR view, like say you want to buy, um, I don't know, this, this 
picture that I have up above here and you want to see what it looks like in your room, um, giving them that availability, you know, through technology would be really great. Now, the good news is, is that Shopify has a lot of the stuff already in place. So you're not like having to build this from scratch. It's not a lot of like crazy amount of investment for you to make it happen. Um, and it's worth, again, back to like the early bird gets the worm, like it's worth really kind of investigating how to make this happen for your store. So back to your question, I think with these strategies, so I think it really depends on what you're trying out and what you're looking to do and what your goals are, how much traffic you have, how many visitors you have, like on your social networks, et cetera. So I think it's, there's not a one size fits all answer to how long or how many iterations of the creative that you should be testing out. Um, and it won't be like a one and done. Like if you have an audience of a hundred people, you're going to have to continually build that audience. Um, but I think that there are some small wins that you can experience. Like even in my organic TikTok with my 50 followers right now, um, if I'm not getting six, six, seven, 800 people viewing my content, um, then it's not a win to me. And the reason why I know it's not a win to me is because I've been putting out enough content to know that that number is something that I should be expecting to see. So sorry, were you going to say something? No, no, I'm just saying, just thinking to myself, like consistency is probably like the most important thing here then. So I guess, you know, whatever strategy you pick, you have to be consistent with it. And I, I think a lot of, I, I mean, we've, we're on the tech side now, but we, we know enough to know sometimes a merchant will try something for like a month. And if it doesn't work, they'll move on and try something else. And I think that sometimes that works. And I think, think maybe it used to work, especially, you know, when acquisition costs were a lot lower and you could experiment more, you could just throw a bunch of money at Facebook or Meta or whatever we're calling it now. And um, you would, you know, get the traffic, but now it seems like you need to be, like you said, a lot more engaging. Yeah. I mean, I think it's, um, it, it's a numbers game and I think it's been proven to work if you're in the right kind of industry. I mean, it's not going to work for everything. So if you're selling, you know, shoes or apparel or um, jewelry or beauty products, like we know that these things work on like TikTok or Instagram or Snapchat, right? Like it's just been proven to work. So if it's not working for you, then maybe it's how you're going about it. Um, and so it's not just about abandoning the project altogether. It's digging in a little deeper and finding out what are your competitors doing? What are the trends? What am I missing out on? And then not being afraid to try out new things like go bold, go different. You don't have to do exactly what everyone's doing. I think what makes something like viral or do well or whatever is the fact that people yeah loosely follow like what's happening but they also put their own spin on it to make it theirs and if you can do that successfully um in your own mind where you're comfortable and confident doing it and putting out that type of content then you're succeeding already and then it's worth testing awesome and I guess just a few more things on the merchant side, and then we'll switch over to the, the SaaS side. Yeah. Um, for for merchants, if you have any advice for, you know, figuring out where to, you know, put these new strategies, who do you think are the, you know, the stakeholders who need to be involved in these um, decisions? Because I think now more than ever, we're all acutely aware that, e-com if you want it to be successful it has to be holistic and there has to be you know internal buy-in on all sides yeah i think that's a good question you know if this is going to be maybe an unpopular opinion or popular opinion i'm not quite sure we love unpopular opinions <laughs> <laughs> i really believe that whoever is the owner of the product like whoever was the originator or like the one that's like feeling the passion about it the most they need to be deeply involved at every stage of the process because it's their baby and they know it better than anyone else. I think when these companies start to try to hand these things off, I mean, there's a point where scale just becomes too big and it's not mm -hmm. possible, but I think we're not really talking about like that. I think we're talking about how to become that. Right. And I think yeah. when you are um, zero to a million or even zero to 10 million, having the people that are really invested in the brand and be a part of that process, whether they're creating content or they're part of the strategy from, you know, like 
what the wording is going to sound like, et cetera. Um, they definitely need to be a part of it. Who else you want to bring into that is entirely up to you. But I think having that person be sort of the face of the company, the one that's speaking out loud, the loudest about it. Um, I'm thinking right now, just sort of off the top of my head, I don't know why this came to me, but like Jones Road Beauty is doing really, really well on TikTok at the moment. And they just started testing stuff out a couple of months ago. Um, and, you know, they've got Bobby Brown talking and she's explaining like, you know, how to use it and why it's important to her, and, like why it's important to women like her or whatever and what it's useful for. And it's just like her sitting there talking in front of the computer or excuse me, in front of the phone for like a minute. And then like, you know, people really like that. So I, I think if you take the founder too far away from it, then it becomes this other thing. In yeah, it kind of strips away the brand DNA. So yeah, definitely. And that's why e we know is more competitive than ever right now. So you gotta, you gotta get people to buy into your brand and who better than the person who invented it. Right. I mean, I, so I think that storytelling has become this like buzzword and yeah. I just be like, oh, you have to tell a good story and like the story, the story, the story. And I do agree that the story does matter, but I think it's authenticity and it's transparency that's really going to make or break a brand. And so if you can do so, like what better than the founder or someone who's like deeply invested in the brand to really bring that to life, you know, and it's great to have influencers. Don't stop on all of that. I mean, that don't, don't go all in on yourself and like, yeah. that. you need all this other stuff. Like influencers are definitely going to help. Yeah. We stuff. don't, we don't need any more founder influencer. Yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> That's an unpopular um, opinion. Yeah. But like, don't be so far away from it because I think that's really what's going to drive that auth authenticity and the transparency a lot further. So it's not just like this really sleek, cool story of like, ooh, we're eco-friendly and like, you know, we're vegan, whatever. Any of those things, those things are great. Those are benefits. Um, but I think why, why and like how it's going to help and why you made it vegan like why why do you care about that not because it's like trendy but like are you vegan like do, did you see some a slaughterhouse and it scared you like talk about the authenticity of what what made you go there in the first place exactly love that all right gonna shift gears a little bit for very um could get a little spicy here uh -oh. um seven thousand apps what does that mean what does that mean to you what does that mean to to all of us that's a lot, right? Like, <laughs> I don't know about you, but it's almost like um, the inverse of watching my Robin Hood accounts. Like, like, like the, the app numbers just keep going up, whereas like my Robin Hood numbers like just keep going down. Um, okay, really bad joke, but yeah. I mean, I think we all feel it. I yeah. wake up to that, you know, Robin Hood every day, and I'm like, I lost how much? Yeah. <laughs> I, I see nothing i see i hear no evil it's just it's just gonna sit there for now because i don't yeah. rent the one runway i'm sorry man i don't know what happened to you <laughs> i went in on you though um but back to the question yeah so there's seven thousand apps they keep growing and it's it's we're talking group. specifically in shopify by the way it, yeah so shopify yeah. apps um you know it shopify presented a tremendous opportunity for app developers uh, uh, last year when they made the announcement about changing um, how they pay out their partners. And so it just kind of opened the floodgates of opportunity for partners to really go in. Um, there is going to reach a point where the floodgate is going to have to close some way, somehow, which I'm interested to see because I mean, this isn't sustainable. I remember the app, the Apple app store, like it used to be like the wild, wild west. And then it just became like, there's an app for literally everything times 500 million. Um, I remember when the peak of the app store was like, look, I have the lighter app or the one that made it look like you're drinking a beer. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Oh yeah. And that, I think that's kind of happening right now with Shopify, like no shade to anyone who's creating these like... <laughs> utility i don't know these apps that are fun to have versus need to have um but i think that there's just gonna so the discoverability is 
getting a lot more challenging. You know, Shopify is now really, really in good ways. They're clamping down on how many categories you can be in. So they've now uh, restricted it to three categories per app which is, I think, a really good thing. I think the days of nepotism, sorry to say it out loud, are over. Um, and, you know, so you either benefiting off of that for a really long time and feeling that, that like, nosedive um, in, in installs, or you were slugging around along doing it on your own. And um, and not feeling the nosedive as much. And, and if you're doing all the right things still, then the installs will come. I mean, that. let's face it, there are 7,000 apps, but there's still a ton of opportunity to grow. Yeah, and I think um, if I could plug the App Collective for a second, it's, you know, one great way to do it. Strength in numbers, apps working together, apps connecting with each other, creating, you know, just a better experience and a better story for, you know, merchants by being connected and keeping that brand in mind. It's like a UGC influencer house for apps, really. I mean, at the end of the day, it's like we want to authentically recommend apps that are going to help you grow your business. And, um, and having things like partnerships, webinars, content, all of that stuff is only going to help uh, elevate those opportunities, I think. And it has to like, they have to be good apps that really are going to help, I think. Yeah. Um, yeah. So I guess we're, we're coming up on time, but I want to know, do you have any general advice for merchants that you'd like to share? Because you've been a, a goldmine of information and I'd obviously love to have you back on because I feel like we only barely scratched the surface on so many great topics, but any parting words of advice that you can share? Um, don't be afraid to test things out. Don't be afraid to dip your toes into the sand. If at first it, it, you don't succeed, definitely try again. Uh, I think something that I kind of just want to leave us all with is I remember back in the day when people tried out Pinterest and they were like, oh, it's not really for me. It doesn't work for my business. And then we learned it's actually one of the largest search engines in the world. Um, I think the same goes for TikTok. It's one of the largest apps in the world right now. And um, it so the mindset of it being just for like Gen Z or whatever, it's, it's not. It's for all of us today. Um, and just spend some time on there, look around, get a feel for things. The algorithm is fantastic. So don't worry. You're not going to see if you're a Republican, you're not going to see things, but <laughs> um, if you're a cat lover, you're probably not going to see a lot of like dog stuff over time because the algorithm really knows that you love a cat. Um, so just get in there, start researching now and then start testing some stuff out. That'd be my, my two cents. Amazing. And um, where can where can we find you online for your, you know, your your thought leadership and your all of this? Um, no, <laughs> um, I'm on Twitter at Deb Mecca um, uh, here on LinkedIn as well. So I'm sure we can help you find us. Um, two of the apps that I do marketing for in cart upsell and product customizer. So in cart upsell .com and product customizer .com. There's an online chat on both of those. If you're looking for me, go go talk to those people and, and they'll link you to me as well. Amazing. Thank you so much. And also want to plug Return Logic. Follow us on social. We're getting more active there. I think it's just at Return Logic. And I hope that that's correct. So, yeah. Anyway, thank you everyone for joining us. Thank you, Deb. Definitely going to have to have you on again. And um, have a great rest of your day, everyone. Thanks for joining us today. I appreciate it.